copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 98. Check all construction jobs in your district for missing dynamite. Any information for Captain Wolf of the Arson Bureau of the Fire Department. That's all. Rolls and questions.
Dynamite in the burning building results in a hurried phone call to Captain Wolf, chief of the Los Angeles arson squad. Arriving at the scene of the fire within 15 minutes, Captain Wolf finds the theater building still burning. Disregarding personal safety, his first thought is to save as much evidence as possible before the fire completely consumes the building. Rushing upstairs, he is met by a scene of utter confusion. <laughs> Where was the dynamite found? Here in the janitor's closet. A boy's got it out, took it over on the bacon lot next door. Captain, you found another part of dynamite. Where? Uh, down the candy store in the cash register. Come on, boys, we've got to work fast. Probably well, we lost more of that stuff around here, and we've got to find it before the fire does. Savage, come in. Yes, sir. You boys fix this for and keep your eyes peeled. Yes, sir. If you find anything, get it out of here and get it out of here fast. Captain Burke. Yes, sir. You and Jones better go through the main floor. Right. I'll be down the candy store. I got a hunch there might be something interesting down there. Well, I can't see why that stuff didn't go off before they found it. None of my funny stuff. It can't depend on what it's going to do. There's been plenty of it that did go from the looks of that projection room in the lodge hall. Through the, uh, through the floor and out the wall. Yeah, well, here's the candy store. And would you look at that floor? Yes, I mean, all over the floor. Well, the planned this job. Didn't intend there should be anything left when he got through. Well, we had to bust in the front door, Captain. When we got in, we found the back door open. Looks like somebody's come in that way. There was a hole cut in the door, just below the lock. Back door, huh? Let's just take a look at it. This the one? Yes, sir. That's it. Looks like that's the way they entered all that. Hey, wait a minute. Did you say this is the way that door was when you found it? Yes, sir, that's it. Just like it is. Open and propped against the wall. Well, then there's something mighty funny about this whole thing. What do you mean? Well, take a look at these shoes here behind the door. Yeah? Well, there's chips in this door in them. If whoever did this cut through their door to reach the key on the inside, how could the chips get in a pair of shoes over here by the wall? Well, I guess you're right, Kato. And what does that spell to you, Wolf? The same thing you're thinking of. An inside job. Exactly. And now the thing to do is to find the proprietor of this place and see what he has to say. What's your name? George Stanley. You're the proprietor of the store in the Wilder Theater building? That's right. What kind of a business do you conduct there? Well, high screen parlor, delegation in the lunchroom. What nationality are you, Stanley? Polish. Stanley, your right name? Well, my whole name is Stan Stotsky, but I change it to Stanley so the people in this country could pronounce it. I see. And are you a citizen of the United States or here on passport? Passport. You realize, don't you, that the reason we're questioning you is to clear up a situation which surrounds the attempted burning of a building where your business is located. Yes, sir. And do you realize that you're suspected of being one of the men implicated in it? Well, I may be suspected. Why not? Well, now, when did you first get to the scene of the fire? Well, my alumna brought me about five o'clock. And when you arrived there, did you go in your store? No, sir. Tell me, Stanley, how do you lock your place when you go home? Always from the back. I turned the key in the back door and then leave to the front here. When you close that back door, Lars, did you put anything against it? No, sir. And whose shoes did we find behind it? I ain't got no shoes there. Well, whose shoes might they be? I don't know. Have you anyone working for you? Yes. Abel Finley. Did he have a key to the store? No, not even my wife has a key. Only me. Now, how do you explain the fact that in your store we found gasoline on the floor and in a barrel out in back of the port? And dynamite on the cash register, behind the jars on the shelf and in the icebox? Totaling 76 sticks with tap confusion. I can't say. I don't know anything about them. That would mean anything to you that we found that the window in your store that was jimmied with the same tool that was used to cut a hole in your back door? And that the tool we found was one that was found in your house? A meat cleaver found in your kitchen? Tell you I don't know anything about it. All right. You can go now, Stanley. There's a few things I want to check on before I ask anything more than you. In the meantime... I think if I were you, I'd think it over and see if there isn't something you've forgotten. Allowing Stanley time to think things over in silence, Captain Cato has numerous witnesses brought before him. The result of his investigation, Ma? Now, would you tell me exactly what you saw, Mr. Gantler? Well, uh, my wife and I awakened at the first explosion. It eh? looked across the street. We live right opposite the theater building. My wife said, look, John, the theater's on fire. 
I jumped up and looked out the window. Sure enough, flames were shooting out of the skylight on the top of the building. Well, I was just about to get dressed and go over when I saw a man come running out from behind the building and then run down the alley. Did you get a good look at this man? Well, I couldn't see his features, but I, I know he was a stocky fella. He's about five feet seven or so. And he was running like the very devil. Now, thank you, Mr. Gaffer. I appreciate your coming to me with this information. It might help a lot. <laughs> that George Stanley never had a car before. But the last five days, he's been driving around in a Ford sedan. It seems mighty funny to me. <laughs> then, of course, I never would have mentioned a word about it, excepting for this fire thing, and still suspecting him of having done it and all. I hope you won't think me a busybody, Mrs. Taylor. Oh, no, not at all, Mrs. Mrs. Waller, Edith Waller. Well, Mrs. Waller, I'm glad you brought this up. This is a very important point, and thank you. Oh, that's all right. Thank you. Thus, from the testimony of many witnesses, the finger of guilt points more accurately at George Stanley every moment. Meanwhile, Captain Enos, battalion chief of the Los Angeles Fire Department, makes his report. After thoroughly investigating the aspects of this case, it is my conviction that George Stanley and Abel Finley, employed by Stanley, attempted to burn this building. What's been done about locating the Finley man? Every police station in all the surrounding towns has been notified to be on the lookout for him. We have a tip that he might be in Tijuana for a couple of boys who've gone down there. He knows this man's got to be bombed before we can do a thing to Stanley. Every piece of evidence we have against him is surely circumstantial. You know what the court will do in that case? Yes, yes, yes. Throw the whole thing out. And we can't let that happen. Now, there's only one of two things we can do. Find Finley or get Stanley to talk. Officers from the Los Angeles Police Department and from the arson squad search through Tijuana, but not once did they catch sight of the missing Finley. Meanwhile, in the office of Captain Wolf. Stanley, how do you explain the fact that your helper disappeared so suddenly after the fire? I don't know anything about him. In other words, Stanley, you deny having anything to do with this case. Of course I do. How much insurance did you have in your property? Well, about $9,000 worth, including the fixtures. You think this will cover the loss? I don't know. I haven't been able to see how much damage was done, but I imagine it will. Have you ever handled any explosives before? I have never handled any explosives at all. Ever have a gun? No. Hey. I don't know what you're driving at, but I tell you I don't know anything about this fire, and you can't make me say I do. You're getting mighty hot under the collar for a fellow that hasn't done anything, Stanley. I was only asking you some routine questions. Will I get all nervous with you pumping all this stuff at me? You think I was a criminal? You might be at that. What's this? Never mind, Stanley. I think you heard me well enough. Once again, Stanley has returned to his cell, and Captain Wolf carries on his investigation. Everything seems to point to Stanley, but nothing definite to be pinned upon him. No actual piece of evidence strong enough to convince a jury. Then a week after the fire, one of the officers assigned to the investigation returned from San Diego with a companion. Captain Wolf, this is Mr. Carrillo. How do you do, Mr. Carrillo? Uh, will you sit down? Thank you. This officer tells me that you had some dynamite stolen from your outfit down in San Diego. That right? That's right. Why didn't you report this to the police when you discovered it? Well, uh, you see, I was afraid to report it because I was uh, afraid that if you want to find out, I get fired. Didn't it strike you that it might be pretty dangerous to have all that dynamite floating around loose? I don't think of that. I was only afraid to follow my job. When did this happen? Uh, on uh, June uh, 15th, sometime in the evening. Have any idea who did it? No, uh, only uh, one of my men saw a car hanging around the afternoon. He told me about it, but I don't think anything of it uh, until next day when I find the explosive missing. Uh, then, uh, as I say, I won't be afraid to report it. What kind of a car was it? A Ford sedan. Did the man see how many people were? That's too many, say. Uh, when he go up to speak to them, uh, they stop the car and drive away. You realize, don't you, that this is a very serious thing you've done. I'm reporting the theft as soon as you discovered it. If we'd have known this earlier, we might have had the guilty parties in custody by now. I know, Captain. But honest, Captain, I, I don't think anything about it when it happened. I was too frightened. Well, he's trying over soap now. First thing we've got to do is check every rental lot and find who rented the Ford sedan on that day. You're the manager? If I am, I'm trying to find 
about who entered the Ford sedan on or about June 15th. They keep records of this sort of thing? Yeah, certainly. But there'll be an awful lot of trouble to find out unless you know the name of the party. That's going to be too bad, then, because I'm going to find out. And if it takes all day, you and me are going over the book until we do. But they feel easy for me, yes. Maybe this will help. If they look bad. Oh, uh, Chapter, it was for certain me to go look through the book. Yes, it's a pleasure. Yes, you'll come into my office. All right. Uh, have a seat. Yeah. Uh, cigar? Sure. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. I, I, I got the book right here. Now, now. Now, when did you say it was you one didn't know about? June 15th. Right around there. Let's see. Now, April, May. Here we are. June 12, 13, 15. How about it? See anything like it? Pleasure, Ford Road. Wait a minute. Did you say a Ford sedan? Yeah. Here's one that ended on the 10th of June. It's the only Ford sedan we got. How long is it out? And then it's see, from the 10th till the morning of the 17th. Yeah, that's just about right. You got any way of giving me a description of the party who rented it? Yeah, I remember him. His name, he said, was Zygmunt. Zygmunt? What did he look like? Well, as I remember, he had a bomb on. But he seemed to be able to drive all right. And he had the driver's license. Oh, leaving the address? Yeah, yes, right in the book. 25, 26, Stumple Street. Oh, yeah, that's the baby we want. How far has the car been driven? Let's see. Out at 31,000, in at 31,650. Hmm, that's got a bit of mileage for one week's driving, isn't it? Sure, quite a bit. But when people ain't charged, they seem to drive more than they would their own. <laughs> I guess they want to get the money's worth or something. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's right. Well, thanks a lot. Well, you've been a great help. Sure, anything to help the law. If, if you ever want to rent a good car, don't forget this place. We got the best prices in town. <laughs> okay, partner, I'll remember that. Well, all right. Goodbye. Call again. What you got in the front of the dance, Sammy? What? I don't know what you're talking about. You mean you didn't run a Ford car on June 10th and two to seven days? I did not. The Sunday? I don't know. I didn't see it. Sonny, but the one neighbor's trying to tell you riding around in one for about a week before the fire. It's all a frame up, I tell you. I never had a Ford. I'm going to explain the fact that there was a Ford sedan answering the description of one who was seen riding and rented on June 10th. Uh, if you to your place of business. I don't know. Maybe Finley rented it, but I didn't. All right, Sammy. You go out ahead and deny the whole thing of the water. And I'll tell you this. We're building a pretty good case against you. Very so shortly, we're going to have enough to bring you into court. And when we do, you're going to have an awful lot of things to explain away, and that's not going to be too easy. <laughs> Checking the description of the man who rented the car with descriptions of the missing Finley, police are certain that the two are the same man. However, nothing possibly is found that can link Stanley with the actual crime. Witnesses are questioned only to say that the man they saw leaving the scene of the fire might have been Stanley, but they can't be sure. The workman from San Diego who saw the two men in the Ford is questioned and says he thinks he can identify them, but isn't positive. Every piece of evidence in, every clue run down, Captain Wolf, Chief Enos, and Assistant Captain Detective Cato meet in Captain Wolf's office to discuss their plans before bringing the case to trial. And he's guilty as the devil. We all know that. I'm skeptical about our securing the conviction on the evidence we have. I won't well, see it on that face if we had Finley, but he seems to have completely disappeared off the face of the earth. I've had men on his tail ever since the fire, but so far we haven't even gotten one good lead. This neighbor from San Diego can positively identify Stanley and the stand. You've got a good chance. He turns out to be another I think so, Arthur. He's gone. What do you think, Peter? Do you even got to get Finley, or should we go to court with what we've got? The place we've no choice. We can't hold Stanley forever on a suspicion charge. He's either guilty and he goes free. But it's got to be one or the other. All right. Because all we can do is to take a chance and hope that the jury sees the case in the right light. I hate to think of this guy getting off scot free. Well, you know these juries. I don't know why it is, but for some unknown reason, they seem to consider arson a very funny thing. I don't understand just what they think it is, but I found that most juries have to have absolute proof in an arson case that they just laugh it off as much as to say, go ahead and burn down another building. They like to have a fire sign. And it's almost that bad, isn't it? 
Well, we can only hope that this time we'll get a jury made up of people who realize how serious a fire can be. July 20th, 1926. Department 22 of the Superior Court. Judge Roger Peach presiding.
understand it, Mrs. Gilder. You saw Mr. Stanley, the defendant, riding in a Ford sedan for about a week preceding the explosion. That's yes, right. And what's more, I know positively that Mr. Stanley... Oh, I beg your pardon, Judge. Your Honor. Mrs. Gilder, have you ever seen Mr. Stanley with a Ford sedan before this time? I have not. Well, he never had one. Is it of your opinion that Mr. Stanley had rented this car? It most certainly is. I have kept your honor. This is the court of justice, and the opinions of the witness are of no value. I ask that that answer be stricken from the record. I am only trying to prove, your honor, that the defendant rented this car, drove to San Diego, and with the help of an accomplice, stole the dynamite used in this case. That is a leading statement. I ask that your witness disregard what has been said at this meeting and contradiction to the ethics of the Supreme Court. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you'll have to stop or I'll clear the court and call a new jury. I merely ask, Your Honor, to have the statement just made in this court written from the record. <laughs> For nine days, the trial continues. Defense, fighting, prosecution, prosecution, returning the battle. And at the end of the ninth day, the case is given to a jury consisting of nine women and three men. In the jury room, 12 people argue back and forth, pro and con. And finally, 15 hours after they have retired, they return to the courtroom, hopelessly deadlocked. They are dismissed, and a new trial is set for September 17th. But the counsel for the prosecution finds that lack of evidence leaves no hope for a conviction, and asks that the case be dismissed. Thus, through the sympathy of nine women, George Stanley, alias Grigor Stanislavski, is free to continue in business until such a time as his accomplice, Abel Finley, is found and brought to trial. Then, and only then, will the truth be revealed. Average person has no opportunity to come in contact with the suffering caused by fire. I feel sure that if the public saw what we in the fire department see daily, its indifference toward the crime of arson would soon change to a feeling of loathing for one who could stoop to such a means of gaining financial aid. The crime of arson carries with it the second highest sentence to be found. Murder, of course, comes first. But arson carries a penalty ranging from 2 to 20 years in the state penitentiary. And in most states, it is impossible for an arson criminal to be paroled. Only through the most minute investigation of incendiary fires can your fire department learn the various ingenious ways that criminals start them. We want to realize that fact. We hope that after hearing our story tonight, the next time you happen to be called for a jury duty in an arson case, you will think more carefully before you reach a verdict. For this, too, is fire prevention of the most important kind. Thank you, Captain Wolf. In presenting this case tonight as a reminder of Fire Prevention Week, we are proud of the fact that your fire department has an amazing record for efficiency. And we're also mighty proud that Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline has been chosen to power all firefighting equipment of the city of Los Angeles. In fact, the choice of Rio Grande Cracked for all police, fire, and emergency equipment by the cities of Oakland, Berkeley, Los Angeles, San Diego County, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many other western cities and counties has so aroused public interest in this gasoline that Rio Grande Cracked sales to motorists are greater today than ever before. And as a special inducement to get more motorists to try this patented process gasoline, all Rio Grande dealers are now offering free gifts. Drive up to the Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline Pump. Ask for your free copy of the Calling All Cars News. And there, amid the true detective stories and latest movie news, you will find pictures of nine free gifts. Take your choice. They're free. The 
Some of the police calling all cars, attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 98. Suspect in this case, please, because of lack of evidence. That's all. Rolls the